there's something funny about cutting from him to, to this yeah, too. It's like just like flowery. Yeah, I mean, talk. I mean, I always, you know, what I said earlier about a movie that can encompass a lot of contradictory information, but it's a, in, impulses to go from one, <laughs> you know, hardcore jails though to like now we're back in in a lecture. Those past two scenes, like Julie and Ethan and the jail man too, don't have Wiley in it. So it's like the, the first three scenes, he's like Wiley listening to somebody, and then all of a sudden he's not even there. It kind of right at, at that point. I remember having this idea early on that w- Wiley would sort of, once he's established, he could kind of become sort of the disembodied consciousness of the movie. Yeah. That we just assume it's his point of view when he drifts into the, to see Julie and Ethan, that he's just observing, and that he could reemerge. But I remember. First talking about the movie, it's like, well, we have this lead actor, you know, the lead character, but he, he kind of leaves the narrative for a while. He weaves in and out of it himself. And that's how we... dreams like that. That's how we do our own dream life. We're, we're observant, and then sometimes we're more participatory, but it's always perspective, you know. And I think at this point we could do that in the movie because we were very much on his... Think about individuality. His perspective had been established. You is mostly a matter of the free choices that you make or take responsibility. You can only be held responsible, you can only be found guilty, or you can only be admired or respected for things you did of your own free will. This scene with uh, David Sosa, who's a young philosophy professor at University of Texas. Um, Think about how it happens. There's some- We were talking about just, you know, what he was teaching, what he was talking about, and we got going on free will, you know, just that fundamental issue. And I said, oh, there's really a place in this movie for that, the free will question that you know, everyone thinks they've answered, but actually all you ever really can do with that is move just on. Just ignore it. Yeah, you move on. And, and we confront that in the scene, too. It's like, yeah. oh, it's so- sophomoric. Well, yeah, but you never answer it. I mean, it's sophomoric because it's scary. So you just confine <laughs> it to this, well, I don't have to think about that then, do I? Yeah, it's so, it, it's what always kills me. Like, the response to the movie always tells you a lot when people say, oh, you know, if they say it's, like, sophomoric or, you know, it's like, so oh, okay, so you've answered all these questions? Well, I you've think a lot on? of times it's people that are so comfortable with their own, you know, feeling like they're an intellectual that they want, when they expect something like this, they want it to alienate everybody else who's not smart like them. You know, they don't want, they don't want it to be broad and to welcome yeah. people into understanding the ideas. And my goal was to, to really communicate. You know, I, I don't want the movie to be obscure. I wanted it to be understandable. I know it's kind of dense, but to me, there's nothing. People are like, oh, it's so many ideas. And it's like, yeah, it's ideas, but they're understandable. If you know English and you can, <laughs> it's not indecipherable. They're not speaking some scientific gibberish. I mean, he's really, even though he's a philosophy professor at a college, I think it's one of the good things about having educators do this because they're, you know, they're good at bringing people into yeah, understanding. They're used to talking to, to people on, yeah. on their level. I mean, he could, he could, if he wished, talk to at a whole other level. And also, but, in a way, they're kind of performers too already. So yeah, I've always found musicians and you know, lecturers, teachers to be sort of naturals. 